Yes, uh, thank you very much. And so these guidelines try to provide a kind of um, uh, a rules of engagement for all sides in a, in a peaceful protest for the police, but also for the demonstrators. Um, and so it emphasizes that this is a basic right. It's a legitimate use of the public space in the same way that marathons uh, uh, are allowed to, to uh, happen on the streets or markets and so on. And it's in, in essence an a, a integral part of democracy. Um, and so what the guidelines try to do, there are really two sets of guidelines. One is on the demonstrations, but also on the use of least lethal we uh, weapons. Uh, it sets out what are the international standards, mm. because as you mentioned, in many countries in the world, um, the U.S., uh, Hong Kong, Russia, um, South Africa as well, um, demonstrations are integral part of how we go about renegotiating the social contract on a mm. daily basis. Absolutely. And I'm interested to see that these guidelines actually also set out standards for the use of tear gas, of rubber bullets, and of tasers by authorities. Can you give us a sense of, of, of what those standards are? So basically, does this mean the guidelines allow for this kind of handling of demonstrations? Yes, so, so the, the traditional approach is that, uh, that uh, the police would use force and use firearms as well, but over the years, uh, these so-called less lethal weapons have developed. And of course, it's much better to use less lethal weapons than to use firearms. But less lethal weapons are not, uh, in all cases, uh, um, not lethal. Uh, in some cases, they cause death. For example, uh, in the case of tear gas, as you've mentioned, uh, if the canisters are shot directly at the head of people, uh, there are many instances where people have died or is shot into a confined space or it's shot into a crowd where there's no way for people to get out without trampling each other. So uh, we then in the guidelines set out what are the standards when this can be used. So yes, mm -hmm. it can be used, but there are international standards. And there's a saturation point beyond which one cannot use, uh, 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 for example, tear gas, uh, because then it becomes, uh, it becomes oppressive and has a chilling effect, and it makes it impossible for people to exercise their civic rights. I'm interested to see that the guidelines apply not only to the member states uh, of the UN, but also the people of those states. How, how does the UN propose we're going to, for lack of a better term, police the guidelines when it comes to the actual people who are gathering in these demonstrations? Yes, so, so the guidelines were issued by the Human Rights Committee, of which I'm a member. Uh, we're 18 people, uh, and there are 173 states in the world out of the 193 UN members that have signed up and are party to this and are bound by the, uh, by the covenant of civil and political rights. Um, the covenant simply says that you have a right of peaceful assembly, but we give content to it now through this new document. There was no such document before. And then states are bound to uh, interpret this right um, and make it part of their domestic law. Um, so these are international standards. They're not directly enforceable. We don't have a police force mm. behind us. Um, but these are member states, and they're bound under international law uh, to comply with the covenant that they have signed up yeah. to. Yeah. Also very interesting, just if we look at the processes involved in these guidelines being drawn up, is it correct to say that this is the first time uh, such a document has been adopted through an online process? Yes, yes, indeed. So it's, uh, we've, been going, uh, uh, we've been developing it for two years, this document, and so we meet regularly, uh, if all goes well, we meet three times a year uh, for a month each time in Geneva um, as, as, as members of the Human Rights Committee. So two years ago we started with this process, and then in March of this year when we had the first meeting of this year to actually finalize the document, halfway through because of COVID uh, we had to suspend our meeting and all of us uh, went home. Um, and then we, now in July we had a month's meeting uh, which we dedicated then entirely to this. There are members from the Caribbean, there are members from Japan, so you can imagine all the time zones that are involved. Um, but we met then every day uh, between two and four hours a day. Uh, and of course we put the document on the screen and it's televised by the UN and so forth, so it's transparent. Um, and then in the, in, the, in the middle of that there was a power cut here and, and, and so forth. But we, we managed to do it. Actually for, we, it was a 40 hour uh, if you add up all the uh, engagements and we finished 30 minutes before uh, our allocated time. And it's the first time that such a document is accepted online. And what is perhaps also just worth mentioning is that one of the big questions was 
uh, does the right of peaceful assembly, does it also protect online gatherings? Yes. We are all used to the kinds of marches in the streets where people are physically present and so forth. Uh, but because of technology, it's now possible to have Me Too or have other uh, gatherings uh, virtually taking place without anybody being physically present in the same way that we were not physically present there. And in March, in those few days when we met, uh, we, we initially didn't uh, want to extend it, or many of us, including myself, were skeptical about including um, and, 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 and expanding the scope of the right. We had a, a meeting in Cambridge with experts, and we had a meeting in Thailand, in Johannesburg, and Mexico, and so on. And so over time, we realized this is really the, the place where a lot of these interactions take place today, and we'll be missing a lot if we don't do that. So just before leaving Geneva, we took the decision in principle that this will be included, and then we worked it out, and now the, the new document sets it out in, in more detail. Yeah, it's part of the course to do just about anything online in the wake of COVID-19. Professor, thanks very much yes, for your exactly. time on the AM report. That's Professor Christoph Haynes. He is. Thank you.